So now let us go into all the miracles. I think I have nine or 10 here. All of them, no, maybe not all of them extraordinary, but many of them very much so. So there's a story that one day Anthony went to Rimini where there were a lot of heretics. He started to preach, but they did not want to listen to him and they even mocked him. In a dramatic gesture, Anthony went to the seashore saying, quote, because you show yourself unworthy of God's word, behold, I turn to the fishes so that your unbelief may be shown up more closely, unquote, unquote. As he spoke of God's care for those creatures that live in the waters, a shoal of fish swam near the bank, partly thrusting themselves out of the water and appearing to listen carefully. At the end of his sermon, the saint blessed them and they swam away. In the meantime, so deep was the impression made upon the onlookers that many hurried back to the city, imploring their friends to come and see the miracle, while others burst into tears asking forgiveness. Soon after, a great multitude gathered around the saint who ex exhorted them to turn back to God. So through this sermon, the city of Rimini was purged of heresy. There is a story of St. Anthony doing, or rather St. Francis doing something similar. Uh, I don't think it was specific to fishes, but to preaching to the animals, saying that they had obeyed God's nature, the nature that God gave to them. So he was going to preach to them instead of to men. Another story, the city of Toulouse was a center of the Cather heresy, which denied the goodness of the material world and also the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Anthony engaged in several public debates with them, but although they could not out-argue him, they were not yet ready to give in. One day, one of them demanded a miraculous proof. Quote, if you can make my mule bow down before what you call the body of Christ, I will believe, unquote. Anthony didn't want to put God to the test, but naturally there was no way he could avoid this challenge, and so he agreed, leaving the outcome to God. For three days, the heretic kept his mule pent up without food. On the third day, a great crowd gathered in the city square. Anthony celebrated Mass in a little chapel, and at the end he came out carrying the Blessed Sacrament. Meanwhile, the hungry mule had also been brought along, and a suitable fodder was placed in front of the starved animal. Anthony called out, quote, Mule, come here and show reverence to your Creator, unquote. At once the animal came towards Anthony and bowed its head and knees before the sacrament. The owner of the mule and many heretics were reconciled to the church. Going back to Padua, there was once a young man called Leonardo went to St. Anthony to make his confession. Among his other sins, he confessed that he had once kicked his mother so hard that she had suffered a nasty fall. Anthony muttered under his breath, quote, the foot that strikes father or mother deserves to be cut off, unquote. Of course, he did not intend his words to be taken literally. The young man, not understanding the meaning of his words, returned home, took a hatchet, and chopped off his foot. The news soon reached the ears of poor Anthony. He followed the youth's grieving parents to their house and made his way to the young man's bedroom. He prayed, holding the severed foot close to the leg, made the sign of the cross, and instantly the foot became attached to the leg. The young man jumped up, giving praise to the Lord and thanksgiving to Anthony, who had helped his leg in this truly miraculous way. Still in Padua, near the Basilica, there was a boy named Tommy, who was a 20-month-old boy who lived with his parents, obviously. His mother had left him playing in the kitchen where there was a large pot on the fire with boiling water in it. The little boy took a stool and started to peep into the pot. He saw his own reflection and wanted to touch it, but in doing so, he fell into the boiling water. Soon afterward, the mother was back, and when she saw Tommy's feet sticking up out of the pot, she, pull she ran to pull him out, but the boy was already dead. The poor mother's screams roused the whole neighborhood, and soon a crowd had gathered at the house, including some friars from the basilica. Seeing the friars, the woman was reminded of the wonderful miracles done by St. Anthony, 
and began to pray loudly for his help, promising to donate her child's weight and bread to the poor if he were restored to life. While the mother was still praying, Tommy arose as if from a deep sleep. Uh, going to Lisbon, Portugal, the city where St. Anthony was born, there were two people who hated each other to death. One evening, the son of one of them met the son from the rival family, which was living close to St. Anthony's parents. Filled with hatred and seeing that no one else was around, he stabbed the other young man to death. He then buried the corpse in the garden of St. Anthony's father. Martin, Anthony's father, tried to prove his innocence, but the grisly evidence found in the family garden was enough to convict the poor man of the murder. Just when things were at their worst, God revealed to Anthony, who was in Padua, the plight of his father. Immediately, the saint obtained permission to go away for a night. The distance from Padua to Lisbon is approximately 1,200 miles. But Anthony was there in a couple of hours through divine intervention. In the courtroom, the saint asked that the body of the murdered man be produced immediately. Anthony approached the corpse and in a firm voice asked the man to tell who had killed him. To the amazement of all, the corpse sat up and clearly said the name of the murderer and attested the innocence of Anthony, Anthony's father, who was freed at once. The revived man then turned to Anthony and asked absolution from his sins. Then he died again. Miraculously, the next day the saint was back in Padua. After all, he had only asked permission to be away for just one night. There was another story of Anthony going to the funeral of a rich man, which was being celebrated with great pomp in a city in Tuscany. Anthony was present and is said to have commented that the dead man did not deserve such honor since he had exploited and oppressed the poor, saying, quote, his heart is in his money box, unquote. He was saying this echoing the words of our Lord who said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But the story goes on to say that following Anthony's words, a surgeon was called in who cut open the dead body and found no heart. A little later, when the family opened the dead man's treasure chest, there was the heart. As a result, the dead man was not buried in the splendid mausoleum that he had prepared for himself, but in a cave by the river. Going to Tuscany now, there was a knight in the area who was outstanding for his nobility and his wealth, but he easily gave way to outbursts of anger. One day his wife, a virtuous lady, probably replied to him harshly, and he was overcome with rage. He beat her, raining punches and kicks upon her. He dragged her by her hair all throughout the house. Eventually he stabbed her, leaving her at the point of death. Servants and family members picked the woman up and gently laid her down on her bed. In the meantime, the knight began to regret his beastly behavior and ran to St. Anthony, who was living in the city in that period. The man fervently begged St. Anthony to come and help his poor wife. The saint hurried to the house together with the husband. He knelt down, asking God to give the dying woman life and health. When Anthony prayed over her, she rose up completely well again. This next story actually makes me kind of nervous and creeps me out a little bit, but God uses whatever he wishes to accomplish his will. There was a nobleman who was very jealous of his wife, and he had no reason to doubt her, but he was an easy prey to slander, and so when his wife had their first child, he refused to recognize the baby as his own. He was more than sure the child was someone else's. No matter how much the woman tried to assure him that she had not been with anyone else, he continued to reject his infant son. In her desperation, the wife and mother came to St. Anthony for help. The saint talked to the nobleman for hours and finally succeeded in making him see the absurdity behind his jealousy. Just then, a nurse brought in the infant. Instantly, his old state of mind returned. At this point, Anthony turned to the child and said, quote, In the name of Jesus Christ, speak and tell who your father is. Unquote. 
The infant pointed to the nobleman, and in a voice of a child much older than him, he said, quote, Behold my father, unquote. With that, the father broke down in tears and took the child in his arms. This is how Anthony saved a family and a marriage from the pitfalls of gossip and slander. So now we're going to get into the miracles that happened uh, after uh, St. Anthony had died. So as we know, he, dwelt, he died in 1231 and was buried for the time being in a little church dedicated to the Virgin Mary Mater Domini, Mother of God, while waiting for the basilica to be at least partially completed so that the body could be kept in a much worthier tomb. His funeral took place on the following Tuesday. Thousands and thousands of people followed his coffin, and they were all crying like babies because they saw him as a father, and not because he was a priest, but because he was a real father to them. He had generated faith in them and was constantly defending them. On the day of the funeral, a woman came whose name deserves to be remembered. She was called Kunisa and had been ill for a year. A great tumor had formed on her shoulder, and she was only able to walk by hobbling along with the aid of crutches. Coming to the tomb, where Anthony had just been buried in, she prostrated herself in prayer. A short while later, she realized that the swelling had disappeared, leaving her skin smooth and clear. She threw aside her crutches and stood upright with tears of joy, and she went home giving thanks to God and her dear friend, St. Anthony. A few years after St. Anthony's death, Ezzelino, who we mentioned earlier, extended his dominion by brute force to all the main cities in the Veneto region, Verona, Vincenza, Treviso, Feltre, Belluno, and Padua. In 1254, four years after the death of Emperor Frederick II, Ezzelino was excommunicated by Pope Innocent IV, who also launched a crusade against him. Padua was therefore besieged by the Pope's forces, which wanted to free the city of Ezzelino's tyranny. The monks there asked for St. Anthony's help so that the Pope's army may be successful. Naturally, not only the monks were praying, but with them were praying the citizens of Padua, who were still in bondage within the city's walls. St. Anthony appeared to two Franciscan friars. One of them is probably the blessed Luke Baludi, and foretold them about the imminent liberation of Padua from Ezzelino's tyranny. And this is what actually occurred in 1256, when Ezzelino's troops were driven out from Padua. The citizens of the city were finally free, their prayers had been answered through the intercession of St. Anthony. Going back to Lisbon, Portugal, there was a boy called Paricio, who decided to go on a boat trip with other boys, but without telling his parents. Suddenly, a violent storm broke out and the boat capsizes. While the other boys, who were older and knew how to swim, managed to save themselves, Parisio drowned. Upon hearing this tragedy, the boy's mother ran to the beach and pleaded with the sailors to recover the body. They lowered their nets and soon were able to draw out Parisio's lifeless body, which they gave to the desperate mother. On the next day, the family wanted to take the body to church for the funeral and subsequent burial, but the mother did not allow this. She continued to pray to St. Anthony, promising that if her child were brought back to life, she would consecrate him to the Franciscan order. On the third day, in front of his parents and relatives, the boy suddenly awoke as though from a deep sleep. The mother's prayers to the Lord through the intercession of St. Anthony have been answered. When he became older, Parisio entered the Franciscan order and always joyfully told his fellow friars of the wonder God had performed for him through the intercession of St. Anthony. Finally, our last miracle. One day, a knight called Aliardino da Salvaterra arrived in Padua. This knight had always despised Catholics, believing them to be ignorant and gullible. One day, while dining, his table mates started telling him with great enthusiasm of the many miracles performed by St. Anthony, just like the, the miracles we were just talking about. As a reaction, Eliadino emptied his glass and said, quote, If he whom you consider to be a saint will prevent this glass from breaking when it hits the ground, I will believe everything you are telling me about him. 
unquote. He then threw the glass to the floor with all his strength, and quite unbelievably, the glass did not break. Not only that, but the hard tiles on which it fell broke instead of the glass. Faced by this inexplicable phenomenon, Eliardino believed and was converted. That is the end of our episode for today with all the miracles of St. Anthony. We will continue tomorrow. So until then, God bless you all, my friends. St. Anthony of Padua, pray for us.